in the woods Morning guys, Dave Camber at the Pathfinder School back with another journal or diary of the TP. Um, what I thought we'd do today is, it's pretty cold outside, um, it's about 42 degrees. As you can see I'm in a t-shirt inside the TP, so that tells you it does keep it very nice and warm in here. Um, I've got a fire going. What I thought we'd talk about today is I've got a couple little historical ramblings I thought I'd go over with you today. But I broke an arrowhead yesterday and I thought we'd go over repairing and replacing an arrowhead today on a wooden arrow and this is applicable to stone bone or metal if you're making sheet metal arrowheads or saw blade arrowheads or pounded arrowheads it'll work the same either way the first component that we're gonna have to have for this is pine pitch I've made a video on it before but I get asked about it a lot um, I've got to make some pine pitch because I don't have any available right now anyway so I thought I'd walk you through the process as we go so stay with me I'll be right with you okay guys we gotta have several components to make pine pitch the first one is charcoal, which we've got plenty of in the fire. The second one is we need raw pine, okay, or raw pine resin. This tin is full of raw pine resin right off the tree, okay. This came right off of a pine tree. It's been collected into this tin. Now, it could be melted down into this tin very easily by putting it in the fire and melting it down, but this is kind of a storage tin that I'm using right now. It's not what I'm going to melt the pitch into. Bottom may have had a crack or a hole in it or something because it sure looks like some of it's leaking out the bottom. So we'll just use this tin instead. Not that big of a deal. We'll get that thing down here by the fire to heat up. I was going to put it in that tin in its final form anyway. So I'll just mix it in that tin. I just was trying to increase the surface area with this other tin to melt it down and I already had some partially melted in there for my buddy Tony Daniel it's no big deal looks like there might have been some wood there that wasn't quite burned all the way through it that's fine we'll just get rid of that and stick it back in the fire grab this other piece and we'll throw it in there smash it up Now, if we're going to great big chunks in here that aren't melting for some reason, we'll just take those out. It's not a big deal. We'll just kind of fish through here and get them out of here like that. Get this over by the fire here. Make sure it's good and melted. It's starting to harden up a little bit. The stuff will harden up fast on you. Now the next component we need to put in here is rabbit poop. I like my rabbit poop nice and dry and gray colored or white colored like it's drying out before I mix it in there. And then I just break it up inside there with my hands into a powder and drop it in. And this is kind of a thing where there's not an exacting amount, you just kind of have to do it from knowledge and what it looks like. I'll powder that up on top of there real quick and then I'll heat it back up and mix it in. Now, while we're doing that, let's talk real quick while we're letting that go about the TP for a minute. So let's have a quick discussion just a little bit about this teepee. Obviously teepees of this style were not something that was typically found or ever found probably in the Ohio Valley area. Um, the spelling teepee, T-I-P-I, is what this is. This is a Western Plains type teepee. Now they did have teepees in the Eastern Woodlands. They were spelled T-E-E-P-E-E. -E -E -E. And they were very similar structures to this, except they were made from wooden poles just like this one is and they were covered with mats of bark or cattail and they were called teepees 
from the drawings that I've seen, historical drawings that I've seen, they look to be about the size of this teepee, which is about 14 foot. The poles look to be two to three times as long as the man that was standing them up in the drawings that I saw. So there were teepees in the eastern woodlands, they just weren't canvas covered teepees. They were covered by bark or grass mats for portability. Teepees on the western plains were mainly covered in buffalo hides and skins. They also had what they called wigwams, which were basically very similar to a teepee except the poles were bent over and then it was covered with sheets of bark or covered with grass mats. And they also had log houses and long houses. All of those would have been typical shelter types of the Woodland Indians all the way through the 1750s. Uh, Christopher Gist actually cites uh, Indian villages along the Scioto River in his journals and he talks about what they looked like and how many there were and up to 300 men and some of the long houses that were council houses were 90 feet long uh, made with logs and covered with bark shingling and things like that so we know that those things did exist in eastern woodlands so this is not a typical example of an eastern woodland teepee it is a western example of a teepee but the structure is virtually the same minus the outside shell it was several poles that came together at an apex in the middle covered by something with a door in the front and a fire on the inside that's one of the reasons I chose to use this type of structure was I wanted to see how well it would maintain itself as a livable structure and right now it drafts great it's nice and warm in here um, I slept in here when it was down right at freezing uh, about a week ago and it was plenty warm in here with one wool blanket so I'm happy with it okay our pine pitch is about the consistency that we want it pull it out of here real quick now when we decide to use this we we'll want to melt this back down like I said if it catches fire on you just blow it out but you can see the consistency of that right now and that's about what we're looking for we're making sure if there's any chunks in there we're gonna get those out not that they're gonna hurt anything because they won't because we're gonna be using this as a paint on type adhesive anyway but any chunks that are in there that you want to get rid of, it's not going to hurt anything either. So we'll set that aside for a minute. Now let's talk about our arrow. Okay, we've got an arrow here that from subsequent shooting, we have broken the tip. Now, we could do a couple different things with that. We could take that tip and we could try to nap that tip back to a point while it's on the arrow shaft. That's a bad idea. If I do that, I can't support the back of it very well to prevent shock from snapping the tip off even further. So really what we have to do now is the first thing we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to cut through this layer of pitch and sinew that's holding it on here. And I don't wanna cut down to the wood too bad. And then I'm just gonna peel it just like this to get that off of there. And then I'm gonna see how much pitch I've got holding it because that pitch can then be put into the fire and melted. doesn't take a whole lot of flame to melt that pitch and then I should be able to just pull that off of there you can see it's starting to come out right now okay now there's a one other problem with this point and that is that the backside appears to maybe be broken too but we'll find out once we get it stripped off of here so we're just pulling everything out of the way, cleaning this thing off, just like that for the moment. Now let's look at our tip here and see what we've got left of our tip. I'm going to have to get a pair of spectacles on to see this real quick. Okay, it looks like the back of our tip is broken as well. You can see that there's a fracture here and here. Does that mean we have an unusable arrowhead? Absolutely not. We can snap that off, use a flat arrowhead, point that down a little bit, and it'll just be more of a small game arrowhead instead of something I'd use for a deer. So we're going to save that. We'll pull our arrow shaft out, and you can see where I've notched this thing. And here's the important thing I want to show you guys in detail now that I've pulled this off, is I want you to see that on the front of this arrow, I've actually chamfered this in at an angle this way, and it's actually almost brought to a point this way as well what that does is decrease 
the resistance when that thing's going through an animal because it creates a wedge. If I just left that, you know, around blunt end and just notched it and shoved an arrow in there, very similar to this, it would create a lot more resistance going through the animal. So you need to trim that down and make that right. Now all I'm going to do is just get in here with my knife and just kind of clean some of this excess resin out of here that might be in here. Trim anything I've got left over on the shaft off as well. Just scrape it off with my knife real quick. Just like that. And then we'll be ready to put another point on there. Okay, so now that we've taken our point off of here and we got a good look at it, you know, I think we can modify this thing good enough to work again as a point without having to put a new point on there. But we're going to have to do some work to this point. So we've got some very simple tools here. We got a leather pad, we've got a piece of elk antler and two deer antler tines. And that's what we're going to use to rework this with, hopefully, to make another point out of it. First thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to break this bottom piece off because we no longer have what we need there. Just like that. That broke it off and now it's at an angle and that's okay. Now let's see what we can do to kind of get this thing back to something that's going to go into an arrow again. Do some pretty good lap napping here to try to get this thing right. Not that big a deal. We can do that. And this is just going to involve taking fine flakes off of this thing up here in the front to get our point back a little at a time. Get our serration back that we had. Okay, we pretty much got our point back now. All right, now we got to work on doing something with the back end of this thing. It'll seat in the arrow just fine the way it is, but I'd like to thin it out just a little bit. I actually like that triangle at the back because it's going to seat better without a notch that way. And we may end up putting a couple little notches on here anyway, just to get it seated in there real well. Not bad. That's not bad. Now it's pretty much at least even and symmetrical. That's a good start right there. Now we know we've got a good shape to our point again. It's a bit smaller, but we've got a good shape to it. Now, if we want to, we can sharpen this tine up a little bit on just a broken piece of file or something like that. You could do this on a piece of sandstone if you had to in the wild. 
files are usually something everybody's got in their kit, either on a multi-tool or otherwise. And I just want a really fine point here because now I'm going to try to notch this thing a little bit. And I need to be able to reach in there to pop small flakes out. And you can see these antlers aren't going to last a long time when you're napping if you're constantly rehoning your tools. That's why metal tools, once they were introduced, were so much preferred. But then again, once you got the metal tools, you could make metal arrowheads. Okay, let's just see about coming in on the side here a little bit. I'm popping a notch out of each side. Doesn't have to be a real deep one necessarily. Don't want to get over anxious with this notch. We'll end up snapping this thing off, and we don't want to do that either. We don't need to be real aggressive with it because we don't need a deep notch anyway, necessarily. Right now, I'm kind of more worried about getting them in the same spot and keeping my symmetry than I am anything else. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. Okay. Now you can see what we've got. We've taken an unusable point and we've basically made it a usable point again. 